Thank you very, very much, Cathy. I'm just delighted to be here. And thank you to both speakers for you know, really thought provoking and yeah, wonderful talk so far. Okay. So I want to talk today about the lived experience of dementia and touch on dementia care. Um, and in particular, the experience of time in these conditions. But I also want to talk about laughter. Um, you may feel um, that dementia is, is no laughing matter, um, but there's an awful lot of laughter amongst those with dementia and as part of the, the many faceted practice of care. Even those who lose much of their language in the later stages of dementia are able to laugh um, and more than this, um, deploy laughter as a kind of conversational strategy um, and build sequences around getting a joint laugh. And I want to talk today about these enduring capacities. So I'm talking about late stage dementia, but I'm talking about things that people can still do even when they lose a lot of, of their language. Um, and how the way in which laughter might not only be life affirming and, and often saving for those living with dementia, but might also reveal much about the relationship to time that we have if we find ourselves in that position. If memory loss happens in the condition of dementia, um, then the loss of the ability to remember can also affect the ability to expect, to predict what will happen as we lose our memory of what has come before. As Thomas de Baggio, living with dementia, describes the disease, it's the eager beast in my brain gobbling time in both directions everything can start to feel unexpected at very late stages. And the fact of this is itself unexpected. We can lose what the philosopher Françoise Dastieu calls the paradoxical capacity to await surprise. You know, surprises can be pleasant or unpleasant, of course, but, but both kinds of response, I think, can, can start to be lost along with the sort of default relationship to time that, that another philosopher, de Praz, calls the serene vigilance with which we expect novelty, we expect new things to happen. And what can replace those feelings um, in this late stage dementia can sort of feel a bit like a constant queasiness, um, an unease uh, that can't quite name itself. But I think people with dementia have lots of strategies, as I'm going to talk about, to, to address and sort of deal with that experience. And they retain those, you know, as I, as I want to say, um, even with the loss of language. In a study by Linda Clare and colleagues, and Linda's here tonight, um, which is great, participants living with dementia um, gave voice to these kind of feelings of unease, you know, one saying, well, I don't know what they're going to do with me in here. I don't know why they've put me in here. And another described the unsettling quality of being unable to remember or predict the future. I feel as though I'm some queer creature who's come to earth here, but who I don't know. The loss of the ability to expect creates a condition of profound restlessness. Thomas de Baggio talks in his account of his own dementia of, of a convulsive time of stumbling and future loss. But laughter might in this condition offer a way to take control, um, at least briefly, of one's communication, to enjoy mutual and equal interactions, and to give structure to an otherwise rather ungraspable time. As an example, here's a passage from a classic work on dementia care, John Killick and Kate Allen's communication in the care of people with dementia. John Killick is describing a photograph taken of him and, and Kath Waters, who had late stage dementia and with whom he was working. He says, in the photograph, we're standing in the unit, my left hand clasping Kath's. We are laughing. Kath's eyes are closed with, I guess, the intensity of the feeling. It's a shared joke, one of many, but since she uses little language, it may be something we have noticed and looked at, or it may have been that one of us has thought of something and merriment has spilled over onto the other. 
as always, there is a complicity that goes beyond words. Developmental psychologists have, have looked at the process of clowning, of kind of absurd behaviours such as nonverbal jokes, hiding and revealing faces and objects, pulling faces, um, as a means of establishing and maintaining communication before a shared language is present. And Killick also describes the kind of clowning that we carry on doing throughout our lives, clowning with water's sort of playful rituals of greeting and farewell, for instance, as a way for both of them to establish and maintain connection without language and on equal terms. Psychologist Vasudevi Reddy writes about such clowning as a stage in developing joint attention. So not sort of reorienting someone's attention wholly to a third object, but establishing this kind of mutuality between self and other that can then kind of expand to involve other topics. And this structure might be useful in thinking about the laughter between John Killick and Kath Waters in the last example, where their mutuality was expanded, this sort of communion between them was expanded to involve the topic of the thing they noticed and looked at. Or conversely, the pleasure of the private thought of one of them spills over to involve the other. The crucial difference, um, perhaps, with, with earlier sort of instances of clowning in one's life is the kind of reversibility of the exchange in Killick's example. So it could be Water's private thought, which she may be unable to express in words, just as well as it could be Killick's, that causes a merriment that the other can catch. Laughter is both the medium and the end goal of such kind of creative interactions. And in, in Vasudevi Reddy's terms, the ongoing interaction itself can be seen as a kind of object of attention, um, a sort of you know, a goal um, that is held in play and shared by both. And at a stage before language is completely lost, words themselves are sort of often repurposed as ways of communicating. Um, so, you know, language isn't just in these interactions kind of ways of making propositions or communicating ideas. Um, Eleanor Fuchs writes in her wonderful memoir, Making an Exit, of her interaction with her mother when the latter has developed dementia. And the function of language as a kind of, of object of attention in itself, a, a kind of, of, of clowning, um, a kind of object of clowning, Fuchs writes, Almost daily on the telephone, we have our weird little chats, our excursions into zero degree speech, speech without intention or result. Hello, mother, I begin, and mother lobs back enthusiastically. Hello, my mother, dother, rubber, brother, dear, dear, lovey, dovey. And then her mother goes on. There was a lot of starting at the beginning, starting at the beginning. Oh, this is marvellous, I chuckle. Mother always laughs when she hears a laugh and we hang up laughing. Language without intention or result nonetheless creates and maintains positive and mutual feeling. And th this is a sort of performance of conversation, a kind of game of conversation doesn't sort of mean it's just going through the motions. It's, it's a sort of performance of being a linguistic creature that celebrates the things that human language can do even while from one perspective, it's sort of failing to do these from in, in a normal way. And the sort of the so-called problem with this language that it's not joined to its present, you know, the present context becomes a kind of opportunity for creativity and play here. And if we, if we just look briefly at laughter itself um, as a, it's also, I think, revealing and expanding on these possibilities for communication. So Harvey Sachs, the father of conversational analysis, has a short reflection in writing on conversation on laughing together in terms of temporal sequence. He says laughing together is special and interesting for conversation because there aren't many things that people do in talk together. Laughter is one of the few things lawfully done 
together. But not only is it lawfully, because we're supposed to be turn-taking in conversation, but, but laughing is not only lawfully done together, but it should be done together. Um, you know, Fuchs talking about her mother always laughing when she is a laugh. Um, and Sack says, laughing together is characterizable as going after various parties laughing separately. So a sequence might be organized around getting a joint laugh. Sorry. And we see that kind of that building of sequence and of organizing time in these interactions, you know, even when language is not doing all the work it, it might normally do. Um, and, it, and getting a shared laugh can be a kind of a shared project in Sachs's terms and an object of shared attention that can improve communication and trust between caregiver and those with a dementia diagnosis. And I can I could share if I had longer examples from the sociolinguistic literature of that. So if we pay attention to these temporal features of conversation, game and ritual, we can see that laughter doesn't always exhaust itself in the moment. Those with dementia, whether or not they still have other kinds of, of language at their disposal, use laughter to build communication, to organize time and create the kind of melody of communication um, that can continue beyond and outside of sense-making. It can be what the novelist Arthur Kersler calls a temporary relief from utilitarian pressures um, and allow uh, those with dementia control, but also creativity in their communication. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs>